not to start it, even though I started going. I want us to look at some concepts related to that as we look through here. This idea of being held responsible. What will I be held responsible for? And first of all, I want us to understand a very biblical principle. Each of us bears the final responsibility for our actions. Now, that might be denied by some in the religious world. There is uh, an idea among some of uh, basically whatever happens, God has literally caused it to happen in the most minute detail. But that's not exactly what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that we have a choice. The Bible teaches that choice is not an illusion, that we all have a choice, what we're going to do and not going to do, and that choice is ours alone. In fact, I would argue that's the only thing we truly possess in life. You might have heard of the concept of a whipping boy in past history, especially in medieval times. Now, there's debate over whether or not that was actually a real thing. There have been stories written about it, and from what I can tell, there's at least some good evidence that it actually did happen. Basically, the idea was when you had, uh, especially like a, a young man or a young woman, usually it was a young man who uh, was of royal blood. They were being trained as a young man uh, by tutors and so forth in the palace. They didn't want uh, anyone to strike the young man because he was royal. That would be considered uh, an extreme crime to, to, to give him any kind of, of uh, what would you call that, uh, martial discipline, if you will, give him a spanking, something like that. But you still want there to be a sense of discipline. So you get a whipping boy. And you give them a whipping instead of the young man. Now, that should sound very unfair because it is. You're punishing someone else for something done by another person. Now, in some situations, the person was actually the friend of the young man, the young prince or whatever. And so uh, he didn't want to see his friend hurt and it was effective. In other cases, it was just a random child, and it was supposed to get the point across, and the prince couldn't care less because it's not him. But the point of that is, we recognize on a very inherent level, we should be responsible for ourselves. Others should be responsible for what they've done. We all bear the final responsibility for our own actions, and it's not right for someone else to bear the responsibility instead. Although, when you think about it, that's exactly what Christ did for us. But he did that once for all. We are supposed to recognize that no one else is going to take uh, the responsibility for me. And I, I am not responsible for the choices of others. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. Here Paul says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So that each one may give account for the things that he has done in the body. Meaning while here on this earth, whether good or evil. Notice that's a very explicit statement. He says each one of us, every individual, is going to appear individually before the judgment seat of Christ. And talking about, of course, the final judgment day. And there we, each one of us, each individual, will give an account of what he has done. Each individual person, whether good or evil. There's not going to be anyone else there, meaning any other person in this life. Of course, Christ will be there saying, yes, this person followed me. No, this person did not. But in terms of uh, our fellow human beings here sitting in this building today, there's not going to be anyone else to say, well, you know what? Neil did this bad thing, but I don't want to blame him. I'm going to blame Danny for that instead. That's not how that's going to work. It's not. We each are going to give account for what we have done. We're going to bear the responsibility for our own actions. In fact, that's the principle that Paul uses in Romans to help us understand how we should treat each other. He says, who are you, in verse, chapter 14 and verse 4, who are you to judge another servant before his own master he stands or falls? He's reminding us of the fact that we will be judged by our master. So why would others uh, feel it necessary to take on that responsibility themselves? There is one judge. And we instead are to recognize we have a different role. We are not the final judge in these situations. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 5, we're told each one will bear uh, his own load. If you look in the context of that verse, he's talking about this idea of responsibility. He says in the verse previously that we need to be very intentional about how we behave because each one will bear his own load. So as we think about this question, we have to start with the realization I and I alone 
will bear, or will be held accountable, rather, for every choice that I make in life. I and I alone will be held accountable for every choice I make in this life. That's what Scripture teaches. Now let's throw a wrench in it, shall we? Scripture also teaches something else. Scripture teaches I am responsible for my fellow man. That seems to be directly contradicting what we just talked about, and yet that's true in Scripture too. You think about another example, perhaps. Uh, the classic story that they made a, a Disney movie about, Beauty and the Beast. You have the, the prince, another prince, right? You have a prince who uh, is rude to this woman who is asking for shelter. And so, as a result, she happens to be magical for some reason. And so, she curses the prince, but not just the prince. She curses everyone around the prince. All the household, all the servants and everyone, they all become household items and he becomes a beast. Why are the servants cursed in that situation, in this fantasy story? They're cursed because they didn't do anything to curb the prince's actions, to curb his behavior. They saw him acting in an unkind way towards others. They saw him uh, going down a dark path. Of course, there's reasons in the story why he, his father was a bad person and all this kind of stuff. But, but they didn't do anything. They didn't step up and stop him from causing harm to others, from going down a selfish path. And so they, too, share in his punishment because, to some extent, it's recognized they're responsible as well by virtue of the fact they didn't do anything. In Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6, going back to, back to this idea of parents and children, we talked about this very recently, right? Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Even when we talked about that verse in Proverbs, what did we emphasize? Well, the opposite is really, in large part, the absolute principle. Sometimes it's not true that uh, if you train up a child in the way they should go, they won't depart from it. Sometimes a child will choose not to abide by the teaching of their parents. But you can be absolutely certain if a child is not trained in the way that they should go, they will not be living right. They will not be following the principles they should because they weren't taught. Unless, of course, someone steps in later on to help them. So you see, throughout Scripture, and that's not the only one, we could talk about several verses relating to parents. You see that parents, to a degree, are responsible for their children's behavior. In James chapter 3 and verse 1, let not many of you become teachers. Why? Knowing that you will receive a stricter judgment. Why will teachers receive a stricter judgment? Well, because the influence they can have on others' behavior. You think about how much damage a teacher can do especially teaching in the context that he's talking about, a teacher in a, a religious sense, in a church setting, how much damage a teacher can do if they lead people astray. But they're not the ones actually doing the astray things. And yet they're the ones who led them in that direction. So they are, to an extent, responsible. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17, we have this idea that those who rule over you are to be given a lot of honor. Why? Well, they watch over your souls as those who must give account. The writer of Hebrews tells us those who are leaders in the church, specifically the idea, if you look in the context, would be elders. They are going to give an account. Well, what are they going to give an account for? They're given, going to give an account for how well they've done shepherding the church, overseeing the church. You go back to Galatians chapter 6. We said each one will bear his own load. We'll go back three verses. Bear one another's burdens and so, for, uh, so fulfill the law of Christ. So we see two principles here. I and I alone will be held accountable for every choice I make in life. We already said that. But I will be held accountable if I fail in my responsibilities to others. I'm also responsible for my fellow man. So it seems that we have two principles here that are kind of difficult to reconcile. It almost seems like they're telling us to do opposite things. I'm not responsible for others. They're going to make their own choices. I'm responsible for others, and I'll be held accountable for them. 
How do we balance that? Well, that's the question, isn't it? How do these two principles work together? That's what we have to ask. And to answer it, <laughs> we have to recognize a very fundamental principle of studying Scripture. It's so easy, so easy, when we are going to Scripture, especially to answer a specific question, it's so easy for us to find certain scriptures that seem to uh, help us understand the answer and stop there. Not take all that is taught in scripture into account, but pick and choose verses that give us, oftentimes, let's be honest, that give us the answer we're kind of looking for. But that's not how it works. I would actually encourage you to look into what are often the so-called contradictions or contradictory statements in Scripture. And not even just the, the silly ones like, oh, well, here it has one angel at the empty tomb and here it has two angels at the empty tomb. Okay, well, one of them spoke. So one of them is talking about the one angel who spoke and the other one's saying how many were there. That's easy. I'm not talking about those simple contradictions. I'm not talking, I'm talking about the more difficult contradictions or not Literally, they aren't contradictions, but the seeming contradictions people will say are there. Things like, well, I'm responsible for myself, but I'm also responsible for others. Things like, well, God is good, but God also allows evil. How can he be all powerful and all good? People find all these different kinds of contradictions, supposedly, in Scripture, and they point to it and say, how can you believe this? You know what every single one of those supposed contradictions has in common? The people who are proposing them are looking at the whole Bible and balancing it together. Am I responsible for myself and myself only? Or am I responsible for others? Yes. Those two do not actually contradict if we understand it properly. But in most situations, what we end up doing is we end up zooming in on one or the other and saying, well, this is true, so this must not be true. And then we try and explain away everything that seems to contradict instead of recognizing that both principles work together in balance. I want us to think about this. Let's assume for a moment that the idea of me being responsible for others, let's put in just this context. I'm a teacher, right? <laughs> So I'm going to receive a stricter judgment, according to James. Well, let's take that as far as some people have taken it. So let's say that someone that I teach sins. Am I responsible? Am I going to be blamed for that sin? Well, let's think about the great teacher. In no way am I comparing myself to him, by the way, but let's take this to its logical conclusion. Let's think about the great teacher. He sure had a lot of followers who left, didn't he? In fact, at one point, he said things that were so offensive to the crowds that he turned to his inner circle and said, are you going to leave too? Was Jesus to blame for his followers' decisions to leave him? Jesus is praying in the garden with his inner circle, minus one. And that one comes back, but he doesn't come back alone. He comes with mob, essentially, a group of soldiers as if they're going to arrest a criminal. And he offers a kiss as a sign of who they should arrest. And Jesus asks him, Judas, do you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? He had said before, Jesus himself had said before, this offense must come, but woe to that one by whom the offense comes. It were better for him if he had not been born. Jesus knew ahead of time that Judas was going to commit this sin. But Jesus was his teacher. Is Jesus responsible? Should we blame Jesus for Judas' sin? Well, no. That can't work. That can't be the way this works. So if we assert that one who is in a leadership position, whether it be a parent, whether it be a teacher, whether it be an elder, if we assert that that person is literally to blame, that sin is now on their shoulders just because the person who they are responsible for sinned, well, we'd have to say that Jesus was guilty of sin because of all the people who sinned who were his students, his disciples. That doesn't work. All right, let's look at the other side of this. First Samuel chapter 2 and verse 29. We mentioned this, I believe, a few weeks ago. 
The story of Eli. Eli, the high priest in Israel, who is given charge of the young boy Samuel. Eli is told by a man of God, even while Samuel is still a child, you have dishonored me. He's told, you have dishonored me, not because of your specific involvement, active participation in what your sons have been doing. Their sons had been taking advantage of people. Their sons had been abusing people. Their sons had been enriching themselves by their position. The Lord doesn't say that Eli is guilty of those actions. You know what he says? Eli is guilty because as their father, he didn't do what needed to be done to discipline his sons. Now, there's a big difference there. And as we're looking at this principle, we need to understand that. Eli is not guilty of the specific sins of his sons. He's guilty of not fulfilling the responsibility he has as their leader. If he had done all he could possibly do, which, by the way, might have involved his sons being executed for their crimes, and that might be why he didn't want to go that far. But if he had done everything he could possibly do as their father within his responsibility to stop what was happening and also as the high priest and so being in charge of the situation, he would not have been held responsible. He would not have been blamed for what his sons did. He was blamed because he didn't do his part. The final responsibility for their sin lay on them. He didn't fulfill his responsibility as their father and because he was high priest as their leader. In Galatians chapter 6, going back to that same passage, in verse 9 and 10, verses 9 and 10, he's talked about we have to bear one another's burdens. He's talked about we have to bear our own burdens. That seems like a strange thing to have within a couple sentences of each other. Notice what he says in verses 9 and 10. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due time we will reap. If we do not, some translations I think say lose hope. I think ESV says give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, I find it so interesting. This is the next thing he has to say. Let us do good to all men, especially those of the household of faith. What is Paul trying to say? You look at that whole context, he puts these two principles together. What are we supposed to do? Well, we're supposed to recognize that no one else can do my job for me. I'm ultimately responsible for my choices. We're supposed to recognize that ultimately I am supposed to help others in the capacity that I'm able to help others. But in the end, those two things go together. And they both are involved in doing what is good. So we go back to some of the examples that we've thought of. Can a child make a decision to abandon what their parents have taught them, no matter how much the parent tries to teach them the right way? Absolutely. Will the parent be held accountable for that? It depends, in a sense. Not will they be held accountable for the actual choice, but if they have not done what God has said in instructing their children, they will be held accountable for that failure. Not the actual sin of the child. The child is the one makes, making that choice. If they have done what God has commanded, not to say that anyone's going to be perfect. If they have done what God has commanded, no, they're not going to be held responsible. Because ultimately, we all have a choice. Is a teacher going to be held responsible if someone that they teach uh, maybe even misunderstand something that they say or goes astray in some way or uh, something like that. Well, if the teacher is not teaching correctly, it's the person's choice how they respond, but the teacher will also be held accountable for failing in his responsibility. But if the teacher is doing his best to teach what is right, to teach what is according to the word, there still might be times where those who he is teaching don't listen. He is responsible for his role in that. They are responsible ultimately for their choice. 
The same thing with elders. As we've been talking about all these qualities uh, throughout the last few weeks on Sunday mornings, all these qualities that should exist both in elders specifically and really in every Christian, at least in principle. Will an elder be held responsible for the sins of those in their congregation? Well, not for the sins specifically, but they will be held accountable for how they handle the responsibility of leadership. And yet, if they are doing what God instructs them to do in terms of leadership, people are going to make their choices. It's important for us to see how these things balance. It's not one or the other. It's not one or the other. On the one hand, I should not, I should never say that I am completely isolated from everyone else and what I do won't affect anyone else. No, I have a responsibility towards those around me, especially those of us who are in some kind of leadership position, whether it's parents, teachers, whatever the case might be. I should never assume that others are going to do what they're going to do and I have no effect on that. I am supposed to be a light. I'm supposed to be the salt of the earth. But at the same time, I I shouldn't beat myself up if I've done everything I can and someone chooses not to listen to what I've tried to tell them, not to heed the advice I've given them. I need to do all I can, but once I've done all I can, that's on them. And that balance is important for us to strike. I cannot make choices for others, but God requires me to do what I can. Sometimes we try and make choices for others. That'll get us into trouble. Sometimes we don't do all we can, and that'll get us into trouble too. There is a very clear balance struck in Scripture. I can't make choices for others, but God expects me to do what I can. We might think about Cain's question at the very beginning in Genesis, am I my brother's keeper? Of course, he's talking in a different context, but am I my brother's keeper? Well, yes and no. (laughs) Yes, in the sense that I'm responsible for what I can do to help my brother or my sister. No, in the sense that they're going to do what they're going to do ultimately, even if it goes against what I'm trying to help them see. Perhaps in God's word. God's going to hold me responsible for doing my part. Both for myself and in whatever capacity I can help others. And I have to make sure I understand what my responsibility is. It's not going to help anyone if I take on responsibilities that aren't mine. But it's certainly not going to help anyone if I neglect my responsibilities towards others either. If there's anything we can do for you this evening, as always, the Lord's invitation stands open. We encourage you to come as we stand and sing.